Hi everyone, welcome to uh, Wednesday night here at First Baptist in Berlin, New York. We are continuing in our study of discerning truth and uh, really glad you've joined us tonight. And I'm going to talk tonight about judging biblically. I think it's a pretty important topic. Um, as we begin our study together, let's have a word of prayer. Thank you, Father, for your word. And we are once again asking that you'd open our hearts, and open our minds, open our eyes to what you have for us. We so desperately need in this day and age a spirit of discernment and just, uh, Lord, we commit this to you, praying that you would um, just help us to see the things we need to from your word. And we ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. As we've been examining what it means to discern the truth, we've talked about the fact, first of all, our first uh, lesson on this was about how sufficient the Word of God is. It is indeed. Truth must be based upon it. It is our sufficient guide to everything. So it's important to start with that. And last week we uh, were defining the idea of what discernment was. Basically speaking, just a basic definition is its ability to know right from wrong. Uh, but sometimes that becomes difficult because error very often closely resembles the truth. And that's when it can be the most dangerous. Charles Spurgeon made this observation over a century ago when he said this, that discernment is not knowing the difference between right and wrong. It is knowing the difference between right and almost right. I think it makes a good point. Those things um, that are have enough truth in them uh, that um, they can cause us to think, you know what, well, maybe this is good after all. Those are the most dangerous of all. Well, is it possible that the claim of biblical discernment has been used by some to justify unchristian criticism? Uh, perhaps there are times that... Um, Christians have become very critical of each other because they may not agree exactly in details of their beliefs. There are those who insist that if you don't cross their t your T's and dot your I's exactly the way that they do, that you're a heretic. Um, that attitude does create divisive, divisiveness. But it also, I believe it also hinders the message of true biblical discernment. No true Christian wants to be contentious. That's not our purpose, really. If, if you just love being contentious, there's something missing in your spiritual walk. That is not an evidence to the fruit of the Spirit of God. And obviously, harmony is preferable to discord. We know that as God's people. Most of us don't like to be involved in a fight all the time. We appreciate harmony and... and um, these things of people simply getting along. But because of this, and because there's sometimes those I think who misuse this, that there, many are afraid to, or they will back down concerning issues which are very crucial to the faith simply because they don't want to appear contentious. And I think it's a huge mistake. Believers do not have the option of compromising truth for the sake of so-called unity or harmony. That's important to understand. That's not up to us. It's not for me to decide, well, uh, I think I'll just back off on this issue because it might make someone angry or they might get upset with me. If it's truth, it's truth. And we cannot, we don't have the right to, to mess with it in that sense. Jude says this in verse number three, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. That's the admonition that comes to us, that we are to earnestly contend, not necessarily be contentious, although some may consider us that way because they don't like what we're saying, but we are to contend, we're to fight for what's true, not to compromise and back down on truth. Well, that means if we're gonna do that, that means we must learn to identify truth. We need to then be able to proclaim it and then identify and condemn error. All of those are involved. And that is called discrimination. Now today that word carries in very powerful negative connotations. But the word itself is not negative. Discriminate simply means to make a clear distinction. That's the basic definition. We used to call someone a discriminating person uh, 
if they exercise keen judgment. They're very careful in the decisions that they made. Discrimination signified a positive ability to draw a line between good and evil and true and false and right and wrong. However, the word can also be used to describe making the wrong type of distinctions, and that does happen. Essentially during the 60s, especially during the 60s, the word was widely applied to racial bigotry, which of course is an evil form of discrimination. So unfortunately, the word itself took on that negative connotation and the, the sinister implication of that is often transferred to anyone today who tries to discriminate or make a distinction in any way. When we call out error, uh, point out something that is uh, wrong, uh, immediately we are now classified with an evil point of or type of discrimination. Now, our culture today is embracing many unbiblical ideas, but because of this view of discrimination now, to speak out against such things will lead us to being immediately branded as, as using hate speech or being judgmental, another favorite term many people use. At this point, many who know little, if anything, about the scripture will begin quoting their favorite scripture verse. They actually take it usually from the King James Version, which I find interesting. It's Matthew chapter 7, verse number 1. You all know the verse, judge not lest you be judged. That's the first thing that many will say. When, we, when someone points out error, points out a wrong, points out something that goes against the scripture. The idea of discrimination, just the basic concept of making a difference, it's fallen out of favor. According to popular culture, we're not supposed to draw lines anymore. We're not supposed to discriminate even in the true sense of the word of making the difference. That's the spirit of this age. And unfortunately, that spirit and attitude has crept into the church. But in spite of the spirit of the age, we are still called to be discerning people. We must develop the skill of discrimination between truth and error, good and bad. The Hebrew word in the Old Testament, which just conveys the idea of discrimination in the scriptures, often translated as discerning, understanding, skill, or carefulness. In essence, it means to separate things from one another at the points of difference in order to distinguish them. That's the basic idea of the word. Discernment, therefore, is a synonym for discrimination. The Greek word in New Testament word we find there, translated discern, means to make a distinction, which is the basic definition that we still use in English. So discernment is the process of making careful distinctions in our thinking about truth. The discerning person is one who draws this clear contrast between truth and error. No one can be truly discerning without developing skill and separating divine truth from error. The question is, does the Bible tell us how to be discerning? Well, last week we looked briefly at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 21 and 22. I want us to look at it in a little more detail today, and I think it will help a great deal. This is what the scripture says, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 21 and 22. Test all things, hold fast what is good, abstain from every form of evil. And Paul concludes, as he is concluding the epistle to the Thessalonians, he, he's listing in this chapter some very basic reminders of what could be thought of as uh, basics of Christian living. In verses, for instance, in verses uh, 16 to 20, he gives this instruction. Very short, um, very brief instructions, very important instructions. He says, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Now, prophecies or prophetic utterances, as it sometimes is translated there, are the equivalent, really, of a sermon today of when the gospel or the word of God has been proclaimed. In other words, he's saying, don't despise the preaching of the word. And you would think, well, who would do that? Well, that's become fairly popular today. Actual despising of of really truly teaching the Word of God. What does the Word of God say? 
So here's the, if we go to that context, I think this helps us understand how it is that we can be discerning and what it really is. We are, first of all, to test all things. First thing we find in, by the way, the context is given to believers who desperately need discernment in their lives or struggling. Test all things means to examine everything. And the implication is to examine them very carefully. That's the call to discernment. Most of the calls, by the way, to discernment, and it's spoken of quite a bit in the New Testament, but most of them are, are aimed directly at church leaders, at the pastors, and those who lead in the churches. For example, Paul gave this admonition to a young pastor named Timothy. It's found in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. He says, if you instruct the brethren in these things, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in the words of faith and of good doctrine, which you have carefully followed, but reject profane and old wise fables and exercise yourself toward godliness. Paul's urging Timothy to know the difference between the truth of God and the nonsense of the world. It's another way of saying that. If Timothy couldn't tell the difference between sound doctrine and dangerous philosophy or old wives' tales, just stuff's been made up, has no real biblical grounding, then he wouldn't be able to protect his flock. So he needed to have that discerning spirit. Throughout his epistles to Timothy, Paul continues to urge him to pay attention to sound doctrine, to preach the word, to guard the truth, and so on. You can see that as you read through First and Second Timothy, but that's not only places we find this. But Paul is commanding him as a pastor of the church to have discernment, as a pastor of that flock to be discerning. When he gives the qualifications for a pastor, Paul actually makes this statement in Titus chapter 1, verse number 9. And here's the qualification that he states, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught. That's what a pastor is to do. Hold fast, all right? Cling to that, that he may be able by, by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict. So a big responsibility of the pastor, one of the main responsibilities, is to be discerning in his preaching and his proclaiming. Uh, as a very, very vital thing for a pastor. Every pastor is required to be skilled in teaching truth and able to refute unsound doctrine. It's not a good, just a good idea. It is an absolute essential ingredient here for a pastor. He must have this qualification, this characteristic. Now, obviously, pastors can and should be growing in this throughout their ministry. But that, that uh, desire and that continual working towards uh, understanding the Scripture more and more should be, should be must be present in every pastor's life. It should be the passion of every pastor because everything that we teach affects the hearts and lives of those who hear us. Sometimes it doesn't seem like people listening to what we say, but they are. And um, they, and would be honest, many people are making their decisions based upon what they hear from the pulpit and if, there's not, if it's not being taught in a discerning matter, they will not have the wisdom to go the right direction. So it's an awesome responsibility. It really is. And the pastor who doesn't take this duty seriously, takes it lightly in any way, he has no business being in the pastorate. It's just not, that's not he, shouldn't, he shouldn't be there if he's not going to take the idea of being discerning. But discernment is not only the duty of pastors, and that's important because uh, I don't know how many pastors are listening to this uh, Bible study tonight. It applies to every single one of us. That same careful discernment that Paul demanded of pastors is the duty of every single Christian. First Thessalonians 5.21 is where he read the verse, test all things. It's written to an entire church. It's not addressed to Timothy or to Titus or any other specific, specific person. It's addressed to the church as a whole. And the word which is translated test... It also can be translated, and is in other points of the scripture, as analyze or prove. It refers to a process of testing something to reveal whether it's genuine or not, especially in such a testing, uh, maybe a precious metal. So it carries the idea, that connotation. Whatever it is that is said to be a, a statement or some type of truth, it needs to be tested. It needs to show up. It needs to go through the trial 
of, of showing, indeed, that it is genuine. So Paul is urging believers to scrutinize very carefully everything they hear to see that it's genuine. And let me tell you something. There's so much that goes on in our world today, even among Christians, that that, that idea is completely thrown out the window. Somebody talks about some experience they have had or something that they have seen somewhere or something that someone has told them. You hear a, a speaker uh, on, on television making certain claims and, wow, that sounds, that sounds great, that sounds awesome. And we go for it without taking the time to really scrutinize it. And if you do, and if you even question, say, well, wait, is that really biblical? You know, what about this scripture here that seems to teach something else? Many times people will uh, accuse you of being uh, judgmental and uh, putting God in a box. I think I mentioned that last week. Uh, we do need to be to scrutinize what we hear. I urge people to bring their Bibles with them when they come to church. And uh, don't be afraid to mark in your Bible just so long you don't mark out the text so you can't read it. But maybe in your margin or whatever, have notes within your Bible. And perhaps there are things that you hear and uh, you're wondering about. Well, go home and, and study those and compare the Scripture. Uh, that's what the Bereans did when they heard Paul bring the message of the gospel. They didn't have the New Testament at that point, but they went to the Old Testament verses that Paul referred to. And they check to see if indeed that's what the scripture says. We need today to examine things carefully, test everything, or judge everything. But wait, someone's going to say, didn't Jesus say, do not judge? That's the favorite verse of many people. Judge not, lest you be judged. And the popular interpretation, and I hear that over and over today, if someone questions a person's lifestyle and says, that, listen, that is totally unbiblical. Really, no matter how much love they may be showing and trying to help the person out of that sin or whatever, just the fact that they disagree with their lifestyle, immediately someone's going to say, judge not. You don't have a right to judge. Jesus said not to judge. Is Jesus saying that we're not supposed to have any type of a critical or analytical approach and as we appraise what someone else is teaching or doing? Is that what he's saying? If that's the case, then isn't Paul contradicting what Jesus said? And the answer is definitely no. Paul and Jesus do not contradict each other. The spiritual discernment that Paul calls for is different from what Jesus is talking about there. Jesus is speaking of a judgmental attitude. And if you read, and it's so important to read things in the context. If you read Matthew chapter 7, verse number 1, in its context, I'm going to read that in a moment. You will see that what Jesus was condemning was a hypocritical judgment of those who held uh, others to a higher standard than they themselves were willing to live by. And Jesus calls him out on that. Let me read those verses to you. This is in Matthew chapter 7, verse number 2. After the famous judge not lest you be judged, Jesus goes on and he says this, For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged, and with what measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye and look at it? A plank is in your own eye. Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Now, this isn't what Jesus said. Jesus indicates they're removing the speck. There's something wrong. There's something uh, not according to the Word of God, in other words. From your brother's eye is actually the right thing to do if you first take that two before out of your own eye. So you have removed it from, a, instead of approaching things in a, a hypocritical fashion, if you truly see something, in some direction the person is going, we should. We are really obligated to try to guide them to truth. Jesus is forbidding hypocritical judging or judging other people's thoughts and motives. And that is a big issue. It's a big problem. Many people do that. Many people in churches are doing that and, uh, very often. They're judging what they think a person might be thinking or what they think their motives might be. Listen, only God knows what we think and knows what our motives are. 
But that does not exclude the proper form of judgment. In fact, we are told to make this judgment call in the right way. Verse 21, test all things. By the way, that ties into the preceding verse. Once again, read things in context. Keep the context there. That previous verse says, do not despise prophecies. Now, someone might say, well, I heard someone give a prophecy in church. And there are churches that claim to have still the gift of being able to foretell the future. The gift of prophecy in the New Testament has much more to do with proclaiming the word of God than obtaining it. There were times in the New Testament, there were instances where there were different prophecies that were given. The scripture wasn't completed yet. But a prophet, by the basic use here in the scripture, is somebody who declares divine truth with authority. So much, by the way, much of what's called prophecies today are actually contradict the Bible. I was reading about a, um, uh, a prophet school, whatever you can call that, in, in Kansas City, and they were talking about the accuracy rate of the prophecies, and they were quite excited about that. I think they were getting over 50% correct, and I'm thinking, have they not read the Old Testament uh, evaluation of prophets? According to that, if a prophet missed 1% of his prophecies. He was to be taken out and stoned to death because God's prophecies always come to pass. I hear continually of people supposedly making prophecies of God and they don't come to pass and people just seem to forget that. That's not the type of prophecy we're talking about here. We're talking not about prophecies that contradict the Bible, not about prophecies that someone is claiming to have some type of a special knowledge, which they do not obviously have. Paul is calling the Thessalonian believers to judge everything they hear and then to avoid anything that doesn't measure up to the standard of revealed truth. There's a standard by which to follow. That's the only thing that we're called to do here. There's evidence, for instance, in 1 Thessalonians that someone had confused uh, many of them concerning the coming of Christ. They were confused. Some thought that they had missed the rapture, that they had somehow, uh, they would be caught up into the tribulation period or whatever. There was some confusion there. So Paul addresses those issues and, uh, and gives them some, some comfort and some encouragement. But what had happened? They'd become very vulnerable to false teaching. And why was that the case? Because they lacked discernment. And that's Paul makes a point of this, to, for them to examine very carefully. Of course, it applies to every single one of us. But they needed to examine carefully the things that they are told, the things that they hear. Does it coincide with what the Scripture says? Does it violate the Scripture? Does it violate the, the concept here, what the Bible tells us? They lacked discernment that they could only receive if they examined what they heard to the Word of God. So the first thing when it comes to discernment is that we must examine, judge everything, but it must be done in the right way. It's not according to our opinion. It's not according to what we happen to feel. It's not according to popular opinion or our culture. We judge according to the Word of God. The second thing is we're to hold fast to what is good. The expression really speaks of jealously safeguarding the truth. I mean, holding on to it, never letting it go. Paul is calling for that careful, that same careful watchfulness that he demanded to Timothy every time he wrote him. And he says this in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse number 20. O Timothy, guard what is committed to your trust, avoiding the profane and idle babblings and contradictions of what is falsely called truth. Now, Paul is writing to Timothy as a young pastor, but there's no question that that applies to all of us. We're to guard what's been committed to us. We've been committed to truth of the Word of God. We're to be avoiding these profane and idle babblings, things that contradict what is, what is really true and things that are falsely called knowledge. The truth is God's Word. It's been given to our custody. We're to be charged, and we are charged with, as you say, guarding it against every possible threat. Guarding it in the sense of, what does it say? Compare things to the truth, to the Word of God, not to popular opinion, not to what we happen to feel about any given question. It goes beyond simply giving assent to something that is good. 
okay, all right, I agree, that's truth. And so it, it means much more than that. And we hold to that. We are grasping it. We're loving the truth wholeheartedly. We love it to the point we're willing to die for it. Paul was urging the Thessalonians to nurture and to cultivate a love for the truth and let that rule their thinking. When, when we really love the truth, and we, and we get involved and we, we read it and we study it and we make it a big part of our lives. Uh, first of all, when we, are, when we see something that's false, it becomes obvious to us. And we get to that in a moment a little bit more. But it is where we, we need to start with that. We need to be careful in this area. Sometimes um, the attitude is that, well, you know what, maybe we should lay aside this doctrine because... Uh, just for the sake of unity. We just forget this. I know the scripture is clear about it, but we can just lay it aside because we want to have unity. That is a mistake. It's also contrary, this idea of holding to the truth. It's contrary to the opinion that many really have today that, okay, we're not really dismissing what God says, but maybe we can downplay some of these things. We don't have to really mention them, you know, and, and kind of put them aside because we want to make our message more acceptable to unbelievers. I tell you, once again, that's a mistake. An unbeliever does not need a message that's made acceptable to them. They need the message from the Word of God and let it do the work on their hearts. Never be afraid of what the Word of God spoken. And by the way, of course, it should be spoken in love and compassion. But never be afraid of what the Word of God can do. It is, by the way, sharper than a two-edged sword. And it does make people uncomfortable. Our job is not to try to make people comfortable when they hear the Word of God. Our job is to proclaim it clearly, plainly, of course with love and compassion, but let the Word of God speak for itself. We're to hold fast to what is good, and that which is good is truth which comes from the God's Word. And we're to judge what we hear, not on the basis of our opinion or whether we like the way it's presented or like the person who does the presenting, but whether or not it's based on the truth of the Word of God. And then we're to abstain from every appearance of evil. There's instruction that Paul gives to the Thessalonians. Abstain's a really strong word. It means to hold oneself back or to keep away from or shun, but it's, it's not like there's an option here. There's, non, there's a non-option package here. It is meant that that is exactly, it calls for a radical separation from every form of evil. Now, that includes every form of evil, according to this passage. But in the context, we can see that the primary reference, it follows the verse that talks about teaching and, and uh, prophesying. So we are to use discernment when it comes to that in a very special way. We, when we hear something taught, we are to examine it in view of the Word of God. And having examined everything in the light of God's Word, and when you identify something that doesn't measure up, something that's evil, something that's untrue, something that's contrary to sound doctrine, then you shun it. Many people have the idea, it's, uh, it's called syncretism, we have... Uh, you can look at the cults in the different religious in the religious world today, and it's become more of a almost like a buffet table. People will go through and pick what they want, and they say, and I hear this often, you know, well, there's 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 good in everything, and the, the Buddhists have some good points, and the, and Islam has some good points, and so I can just take all the good things. Well, remember that is one of Satan's favorite tricks. If, if there is something, if there's a false teaching which is totally contrary and it contradicts everything that's good and true and wholesome, then it's, it's a little more obvious. But he, he really loves to get it as close to truth as he can. So we have to be careful. Just because there might be some uh, truth, some true statements within something else, that doesn't mean that we still can embrace their teaching. It needs to be when we see there is there's false teaching. And that teaching has to do with, really, our relationship to Jesus Christ. When you have religions that teach, well, yes, Jesus was a good guy. He's a good person, a good prophet, but he wasn't God the Son. You have an issue. You have to shun that. Avoid it. Don't just say, well, yeah, there's still good in here, and we'll, we'll take the good that we can get. We're to shun that which is not sound doctrine. And some believe that the only way to defend against 
false doctrine is to study it specifically to the point that you're proficient in it and you understand you know everything about that false doctrine, the ins and the outs. I caution you in this because I think we're, we're missing the point. But our focus should be on knowing the truth. Understand that sometimes it's, it's helpful that we can uh, study the cults well enough that we know how they approach and, and know how we can best speak to them, knowing how they're thinking in certain ways. But that's not the way to identify, or really it's not the best weapon against the cults. Realize this, that when federal agents are taught to spot counterfeit money, they don't do that by studying all the counterfeits. First of all, there'd be so many counterfeits and there are people constantly making new counterfeits, they can never study them all. What they do is they study the genuine bills until they master the look of the real thing. They're focused on that. When they do that, then they can see bogus money. When they see it, they recognize it. Now, maybe you have, this might have happened to you before. You've given and change maybe a nice crisp bill, especially if it's a higher denomination. You've got a, a 50 or something and, and you hold it in your hand, you're going, wow, doesn't feel quite right. And you're hoping it's not counterfeit. Um, now, unless you have the, the distinct ability to determine that, the only thing you'll be able to do is take it to the bank and see what they tell you about it. But can you imagine someone who's really trained in what the real thing looks like that's how they can determine counterfeit. And that's really the best way for us to detect a spiritual counterfeit is to know what the real thing looks like. That requires a discipline. We need to be in the Word of God. And I'm afraid a lot of Christians are very ignorant of basic, basic theology. And they can hear something and they don't. there's no bells ringing, there's no lights flashing because they don't know the truth well enough that they can recognize evil. That's the place to start. Study the real thing, and it will help you to determine what is evil. You see, Satan is subtle. He often sabotages the truth by mixing it with error. Uh, Spurgeon was right in his description there that uh, discerning is more than just determining right from wrong. It's determining right from nearly right, because sometimes things are very close. Truth mixed with error is usually far more effective and it's far more destructive than just a straightforward contradiction of the truth. We can see those things easier. So be aware. Un understand truth. Make a study of the Word of God. Read it. Listen to it. And examine it. Comparing the Scripture to Scripture. Everything you hear or everything you read that claims to be biblically based is not necessarily pure truth. And you need to be discerning in that. Remember, Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. For it's not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves, themselves as servants of righteousness. That is exactly how it works. The idea of being able to discern truth from error is one of the most important things you're ever going to experience. It's vital. Pastors have an awesome responsibility to do this. We should spend a great deal of time studying and knowing the Word of God, pointing out error, uh, and helping those that God has given us the responsibility of teaching and leading and guiding. But it's not just the pastor. The idea of discerning and discernment is for all God's children, and you need to apply that to your lives. Next week, we're going to look at some, I think, some very practical things that will help us become more discerning. And I pray they'd be a great help to you. And uh, so desperately do we need a spirit of discernment, especially in this day and age. We thank you for joining us tonight and encourage you to be with us. We will have, um, of course, our Bible study next week on Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. encourage you to be with us then. And uh, Sunday, this coming Sunday, we're having a, a missionary speaker, uh, our missionaries, the Nielsen's to Japan, they'll be with us. I'm not able to have a recording of that. We, I'll be bringing a message about missions uh, for the online service, but we just ask you to be in prayer for that. And if you're able to be with us on Sunday morning, uh, we are welcoming the Nielsen's, our missionaries to Japan, longtime missionaries from First Baptist. And also after church, we're having a covered dish dinner. I invite you to come and uh, to be part of that as well. You get to know the people.
and uh, get the chance to speak to missionaries. Thank you once again for being with us tonight. God bless you. Have an awesome week.